sir. Amen. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Ooh, I love that song. That's good. I love my father's house. You know, I say that word so much when I'm doing funerals and talking about it, but I can't get away from what Jesus said in my daddy's house. I have many rooms. Amen. Corey and I were talking about our home today. You know, I mean, we, uh, Cochise. How many, y'all remember Cochise? Riding a motorcycle. Well, he rode it out to church on Sunday, and I, I hauled him home. <laughs> he had a flat on a brand new tire. So he called us up, and me and Johnny picked him up on the trailer and hauled him all the way home. He's got a little bitty house. Amen. I told Lori, if I, if I was by myself, I'd be have a little bitty house too. You know, it wouldn't be no big one. But in my father's house, I wonder if God will design your room in heaven according to how you act here on earth. You hear what I'm saying? You know, well, it says a mansion, but, the, but, the, but it's in my father's house or many rooms. That's the original translation. So it has, we don't get a mansion. You get, what would you need a mansion for still? You know, so. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious how God's going to work this thing out, you know, if, if it's how, you're, how you act here, or does he realize your personality, or if you're a good cook, or, you know, is he going to put a Chick-fil-A in your room, you know, I, I, you're just, you're just kind of really curious how heaven's going to be and what it's going to be like. Even on Sunday morning, I talked to you about Gideon. I talked to you about judges who turned wrong back into right, and how the revelation hit me and how important it was for our Supreme Court judges to finally make the right decision to turn wrong back into right. Not games and other places like that. They stood up for a coach uh, who had brought it all the way to the, he got fired for praying with his players. You know, when I was in school, we prayed. Now, I was an unbeliever. I didn't know Jesus. But every morning, we read scripture in Miss Boozer's room. Uh, you got spankings when you got in trouble. Uh, you went to the office, and then you got a spank when you got home. These, these, were, these were natural things that happened. We did the Pledge of Allegiance every single morning. This was school for me. And here I am. I'm an unbeliever. And then when I got in trouble, and I, was, I mentioned Miss Boozer. When I got in trouble, seventh grade, when I got in trouble with Miss Boozer, she would make us write Scripture. We would write chapter after chapter from the Bible. You know, and my parents never got upset, never went and protested it, never got mad about it. They just figured I got in trouble, and, you know, it, it, sure, it sure beat right, and I will never do it again on the board a hundred times. Amen. So she'd have us write Scripture down. And, and uh, so th this went on. <laughs> this was my life coming up. And then to hear the way things have gotten since I have got out of school, I was glad to hear our Supreme Court make a decision. Whenever there's a, a, a fight, particularly when you start studying the Old Testament, Almost every Old Testament fight, when you read about King David, whether it was Abraham, whether it was Moses, whether it was Deborah, uh, Joshua, three things I saw every time in the fight. First, I realized they were unavoidable. It was, it was going to happen. You're going to have to fight. You're not going to get to promised land without a fight. David was not going to be able to get his wife and his family back without a fight. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the guy that went into a pit on a snowy day. And, and he fought a lion. Benaiah, his name was Benaiah. It was his name. Benaiah went into a pit on a snowy day and fought a lion. It was unavoidable. It's something that had to happen. The second thing, it's untimely. You will never get to a place in your life where you're in shape enough spiritually to fight. It don't happen. Amen. It's always untimely. It hits you at the worst possible time. I hear people use that phrase all the time. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. Losing the job. Having a, 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 sick, a kid sick at home. Why couldn't they got sick in the summer while they were already home? But now they're sick during school time. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. And the third thing I've seen over and over, it's often unequal. Well, when you realize that Satan has had over 5,000 known years of practice in dealing with humankind, and you've only been here, what, 30, 40, 50, maybe 80 years, amen, that's not a long time to learn how to fight. So it's, it's unequal. Uh, our fight against him, when we realize the Scripture says we're not, we understand his schemes, we know what he's doing, but it's unequal. There's no way you can say to yourself in your own strength that you're more powerful than Satan. So there's this fight that's going on within our lives all the time. So to look at that again, it's unavoidable, it's going to happen, it's untimely, and it's often unequal. When we talked Sunday, we talked about Gideon. For seven years, the Midianites raided. Why after seven did, did he say enough's enough? Because the angel of the Lord showed up and said, hey, thou mighty man of valor, and called him into action. It would have been eight, nine, ten years. Sometimes God's got to get your attention and tell you that it's time for you to fight. 
It's time for you to quit laying over and quitting on your kids, amen, and quitting on other people. It's time for you to fight and remind you that you're a child of the king. Mighty man of valor, he said to him. 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, not is, but as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. When I read that scripture, I see a nature of Satan that shows up to see that it, there's a ferociousness about him, there's a, a loudness about him, there's an intimidation about him. And what happened over the last few days when this young man fires off a rifle and kills seven people now, another one died on, on our way here, seven people wounded over 30, it brought terror into that area. We all understand that because of 9-11. We didn't even understand really terrorism until 9-11. We'd heard about it in a distant land, but it didn't affect us until it hit our shores. And terrorism has a lot to do with trying to put you in a place of suspense. As a matter of fact, well, this is what happens. First, whenever there's terrorism in a life, it will intimidate the population. I saw that watching the news today. It intimidated the whole population. They don't want to go out of their houses again. They don't want to take their children out. They ne they're going to a parade. We hear the term uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome that that's going to be happening to a lot of the people there because there's fear there now amen so that's what terrorism does the next thing it does it tries to change the mode of living tell me if you ever been on an airplane and the plane got up in the air and the light came on and people started lighting up cigarettes i have you ever been on a plane when you carried your knife with you i did amen I'm, as a matter of fact before 9 11 it was just different you just got on the plane and you took off then after that, our mode of thinking changed. How we did things changed. All of a sudden, there, there was these uh, uh, tunnels we had to go through. We had to get it checked. We had to be x-rayed. Our stuff had to be x-rayed. So it kept you in suspense. The most anxiety that I ever go through in America is airports. I ain't scared of nothing there. I just don't want to have to go through taking my shoes off and walking barefooted and, and taking my belt off and taking, you know, stripping down and, and having people search. And every time it seems like they get to search me. I look back, why don't I search you? I, I, I don't know if I'm good with you, you know? So, so this is what happens when it, when it takes place. The third thing that happens, the influence of the government. Whenever there's terror, watch our government right now. What are they going after the Second Amendment? Because somebody used a gun. Now, first off, they ain't never going to be able to get all the guns away from us. It's just the way it is, okay? And it's not about us being uh, belligerent or mean. There, there are, I think, about three times more guns in America than there are people. So you, you can think about that. Now, I know in certain places they don't, they don't know that. But, but here, if, 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 if all our guns are taken away, if, uh, and this is an old cliche again, if uh, abiding citizens have their guns taken away, only the criminals will have them. Amen. And then we're at the mercy and we'll look like Chicago. Because that's what's going on. So, but what it's done, it influenced our government. Amen. Terrorism does that, uh, whether it be TSA or however. It does. So, in, in this case, it happened to Gideon. It, it, it affected his place where he was at. It, it intimidated the population, all the things that were going on. And so, we'll get to him in a minute. We're going to talk about another judge tonight. But they're two distinct. And I look back to when I first started preaching this, Cheryl. It was 2005. I didn't realize it was been that long since I talked to you guys about the nature of a lion and how much how, and how important had been. And some of you remember this teaching. It changed our church because it was me hunting for something. It was like when I found the two words holy and wild and they connected together. And all of a sudden I go, oh, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. It, it, it changed everything about. And I started preaching that and teaching that everywhere I went all over the world. Amen. So then, then when me and David Hilton, Pastor David, we were together, and Pastor Miles Monroe started talking, and I'm, I'm looking at him, and all of a sudden, my baby's jumping, David's baby, we're laughing, we're crying. I mean, we're like the only two preachers in this place that was really catching what this man was laying down. It shifted everything inside of me. Again, there are two natures that are in the Word of God that describe a child of God, that of a sheep, and, and it does. It tells us about sheep. Isaiah tells us that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And then Peter reinforces it in the New Testament when he says, You are continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned, 1 Peter 2.25. He said, We are reminded that Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. And when Jesus addressed Simon Peter, amen, in the book of John, he told Peter to feed his sheep if Peter truly loved him. And he said in John 10 that his sheep know his voice. So we understand that our nature is like sheep. But you've heard me say this for years now, believers, disciples, and Christians. 
believers, disciples, and Christians. If you're watching me right now, believers, disciples, and Christians, it's the process in which we work. I believe that every believer, basically, when they start out, are sheep. We start. We need somebody to feed us. We need to have somebody to tell us what to do, what to read, where to go, how to pray, how to witness. You know, how, how do I how, how do I live this thing? Who do I, should I fellowship with? All these things take place. How how to be a parent? How to be a, a husband, a wife? All all of that. But Revelation five lays out another nature, and you got to get back to this, because if there's one thing that's going to de in defeat intimidation, it's a lion. If there's one thing that's going to stop. The craziness that's going on, it's when the lion rises up. I watched today videos out of um, the, the shooting that took place up north of Chicago, and I watched another video of one that took place in New York. And you know what I was looking for? Who ran back? Who did not run away but stopped and faced the gunfire? And I was watching. I saw, and, and nobody, you know, it, it, that didn't bring this up on TV. And I ain't saying, Jerry, would you do that? I don't know. But I look for those who turn back toward the fire to protect those that are around them. Instead of just running for their lives and scared and fearful, amen, it turned back around. That lion spirit that's got to come back up inside of us. There has to come a time in your walk with God that that spirit that, that's been sleeping wakes up. There has to be an hour when the roar against the enemies comes forth and claims your territory. There has to be a moment. I think I put this on the overhead, Sister Lord. Amen. There has to be a moment when you say enough is enough and the lion takes over. And let us begin to declare in the earth a reformation has come. Our whole nature is shifting. Our functions, structures, thinking, and patterns are changing. That's why I told you it's not up to me to tell you all what to do and how to live for God. You're going to have to learn this thing for yourself. I'm going to teach you the Word of God, but you don't have to call me and ask me, now, should I do this, should I do that? Look, the Bible will teach you that. You've got to become, you've got to self-disciple yourself. Amen. You've got to bring yourself out of a place of intimidation against the, the enemy. We, we've been caressed. We've been coddled. Amen. We've been, we've been looked after for so long. We've been pampered and nurtured forever. So the voice of the, of the lion rises up within us and begins to roar. It says enough is enough. Amen. And when that takes place, things begin to change. Now, let me tell you about this, this scripture again out of the book of Revelation. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. When I read the scripture out of there, I see, I see several things, but watch this. The root of David. If there's one man in the Old Testament that shows up like a lion, it's David. And everybody that got around him, the scripture talks about the men, had beards and look, they've had the faces of a lion. There's something about he attracted them into the caves, amen, and out in the woods. Everywhere he went, he had this lion attitude. So from the root of David, Jesus came, amen, and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, which means that tribe is not sheep, but that tribe has to be a group of lions. And it's my prayer before I die, as I, as I see churches mature and people grow up, that we start seeing people act more like lions. Amen. And start, you know, you don't have to run off from the sheepfold. You don't have to be coddled. You don't have to be told you're going to make it all the time. Listen, it's time for you to tell somebody they're going to make it. It's time for you to stand up and say, look, you can pray too. You can raise the dead too. You can pray over people too. Amen. You have to start getting to that place. It ain't just about the preacher anymore. Can I get an amen? Thank you so much for amen in me after I ask you to. Lions, my friend, are territorial. They're territorial. I remember teaching this again 15, 16, 17 years ago when my, when my boys were young. And I remember after teaching it how they understood the idea of marking their territory. If you've got boys or grand boys, it won't be long. They're going to learn how to mark something. Amen. They're going to spray down a tree outside. Matter of fact, the smartest thing you can do is teach them to go outside and pee on a tree. Amen. Because it's, it's going <laughs> to... I just, you know, I talked to Colton on my way here, but when he was two or three years old, he sat in the back of my truck. I'd be driving somewhere, and he'd go, Papa, I pee. He started out just like that. And then, and then after about the fourth time, I got to pee. Papa, I got to pee. Because I got him. He's restrained. He's in a chair. He ain't got no choice. And I just stopped anywhere, let him out, and he marked whatever's there. And that's his. Amen. He's, he's going to go out. Now, do you say, the Pastor, that's terrible, Papa. No, it's not. That's what lions do. If you, if you watch any males in any species, they mark in territory. Amen. They're looking after territory. My dog, he's a 130-pound marking fool. 
I let him out of the house. He, he ain't worried about running. He's got to mark everything all the way down through the property. And you, you promise yourself, he got to run out in a minute. I don't know. I guess he just knows how many places he's got to mark, and he disperses it evenly. Amen. Because he just all the way down, all the way back around. He's got to hit it. He's mark, He's letting all the other dogs that know around, I'm the big dog here. He mean, ain't another dog here. Lions mark their territory. They repeat this spraying process many times to keep their enemy at bay. 2 Corinthians 2.14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. There are people that get around you as a believer and a, and a disciple and a Christian of Christ, amen, and, and to them you like death. I, I, I actually studied a little while some of the liberal theology and thinking, not theology, ideology, about the death to babies and, and, the, and the LGBTs and, and the uh, women's rights and where it's going and all this, and I was shocked that I have, my mind is so far away from that thinking. I can't even think that way. Amen. Everything that you've been promoting, they've been uh, unpromoting. And it's just like, I, I didn't know people were really that mean that they existed out there. But there was such a, a militant about them. And I thought, dear God, the church has got to rise. We've got to become militant again. Not mean, not mean, but militant. And we've got to mark. And the scripture says here, watch this, the smell of death to the other, the fragrance of life to others. There are certain folk you get around, you know what you smell like? You smell like Jesus. When last time somebody told you, you smell like Jesus. Amen. I, I can sense that you're a child of God. You smell like Jesus. Amen. Look, I got a bottle of some fragrance. Jesus. Amen. So you smell that way. Another thing a lion is, he's not a victim. You know what? He robs him of his inheritance, a royal possession. The lion has a keen sense of smell, mostly to locate his prey or his enemies. Anything that would rob his purpose, the lion the, is the full growth of the lion mane represents his majesty and maturity. Amen. Put on the full armor of God. He has inherent vision. One study revealed that when a lion cub is born, he is again, he, he is born with his eyes open. Amen. In other words, it don't take time for his eyes to open. He's born with his eyes open. A lion is born with night vision, ability to recognize the enemy. He has acute hearing, ability to hear little sounds, a still small voice. To detect an enemy afar off. Our enemy acts as a terrorist. They, Satan acts as a terrorist. He thinks all the time, I'm not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. But he's a terrorist. And he tries to shut you down. He tries to shut my family down, my friends down, the people I love down. He tries to keep you in fear, to keep you intimidated all the time. And literally, I've had, I've, I've, had, I've had enough years ago. That's why I keep preaching the way I'm preaching. But what's needed is the spirit of leadership. It's, it's like a defining moment. What happened to Gideon's life in the wine press is a defining moment. Everybody has defining moments in their life where something shifts, where something changes. Amen. Your mentality changes. It inspires others to have hope in the face of great odds and causes the leader to cultivate a spirit of purpose, daring, passion, and conviction. When this man Gideon, I'm going back to Sunday again. I'll get on a new judge in a minute. But let me just keep talking about him. When he come up out of that pit, it went from 32,000. Went to 10,000, lost 9,700 of them, ended up with 300 people with pots with light in it and blowing a trumpet. The Scripture never said only those that know how to blow a trumpet uh, show up. No, it was those who were ready drinking the water. It doesn't even tell you. Have you ever tried to blow a trumpet? I can't blow a trumpet. you gotta, you got to pierce your lip. What's it called? It's piercing. Is that right? It's called person, something like that, person. You got you to put your lips in a certain Yeah, like that. You got you to do your lips a certain way. So he got 300 guys. I don't know if he got to train them to blow the trumpet or if all you got to do is throw some wind through it. If you've ever tried to show far, amen, the, the ram's horn, to blow it is what they always would use. You can't do it if you're a rookie. So you have 300 men that got to learn how to blow this trumpet, get up on the hill, crack the pot, show the light. And this is leadership, that you're able to encourage and, and inspire these men and women to do this thing. So, so it, it, it just, I, I love Gideon. I just love it. Now, let's go to this next guy. His name's Shamgar. There's only two verses dedicated to him. He was the third judge in the book of Judges. 
who ruled Israel under the Philistine tyranny. When you say tyranny, it's connected with terrorism. It, it's servitude. It's putting you down. It's, ta- it's overtaxing you. Uh, it's, it's putting you into a place of bondage. Uh, the highways were cut off. I mentioned this on Sunday when I talked about all the judges. When I say highways, I'm talking about life source. If 2100 shut down, it leaves you on the back roads. But if this was the only road through this town, you'd be having to take, go through the highways, and, I mean, through the byways and the, and the hedges. The only way that you could get anywhere. So their main road was cut down. The Philistines had taken it over. It was cut off, and the Israelites had to run through the bushes. If you're in the bushes, you better prepare for an ambush because they're going to catch you there. So this is like living like a sheep. This is living like a sheep. This is knowing somebody else is, is out there, the intimidation, the terrorism. This is what was happening to this man. Judges 5, 6 says, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned, travelers took to winding paths. So this is what Deborah said in her song. Matter of fact, Judges chapter 5 is Deborah's song. Of course, she was another judge. So she brings back, she mentions this man Shamgar, that during that time in his life, travelers were taken to winding paths, the roads were abandoned. So we back up to Judges 3.31, and we find this one verse on him. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Now, an ox goad was an eight-foot pole with a point on the end. Amen. It's just a hard stick, amen, that you could poke the animal and force that animal to keep on going. That's all he had. So so I'm going to give you a couple real quick points here, amen, how he got his roar back. First, he had to get fed up. You got to get fed up. You got to get tired of what's been going on. Amen. You've got to get to a place. Shamgar's name means God has given. His father's name, Anak, in the Hebrew means the answer. So God gave the answer through his son, Shamgar. Amen. Now, Shamgar had a situation. He, could, he couldn't go get his groceries. Uh, we were going up to Pike's Peak on that, on that, uh, that cog. They call it a cog because it runs on a cog. Literally a giant long cog. So we're going up there. And have you ever done the cog? You done, Marie? So when you're going up on the cog, there's a certain place where they tell you that there's a, the, the proprietor, proprietors of the track live right there. They point it out. They point out where they live. So you're going up this thing, and I forget it took us over an hour to go up to the top of that mountain. But he, he points over at that, and they've got a couple old beat-up vehicles. He said, when this man goes to town, it's, uh, it takes him, uh, it, was, it was like six or seven hours for him to go through the winding roads to get off that mountain to get to town. Therefore, when he went to town, he always got plenty of groceries. You know, isn't it great to live near Kroger's, HGB, and Walmart's, amen, just right down the road? Even your local grocery store got enough for you to survive on. Twinkies and soda, you know, and we we can make it on that. So so here, here, they had to go a long way. So here, they can't get out. They can't go. Yeah, their situation is the Philistines were possession what belonged to them. The highway. It was their highway. So what do you do when someone is possessing your possessions? And this is not an uncommon occurrence for the people of God. For Shamgar, his road was occupied. Shamgar got tired of walking through that snake-infested, muddy when it rains, hot when it doesn't, woods. Amen. He's now he's fed up, and he's going to work, going to go through the unordained route. Amen. He's going to go out through the front door. And I've often said when Sister Shamgar heard that front door slam, she knew her husband had had all he could stand. Amen. He couldn't stand some more. He's heading right out the door. The solution for every situation, God has a solution. And in this place, it was attitude. Change your attitude. Amen. Enough is enough. Imagine Shamgar in the field at the end of the day thinking how nice it would be to go home on the highway and not going through the woods again. How nice it would be to get my life back right again. Amen. You have to come to a place when you say, I've had all I'm going to take. Amen. you got to change your attitude. you got to believe God for the best in your life. So he activated. Next word, activate. Use what you have and stop using excuses. I always got an excuse. Well, 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 well you know, I, I go to church, but. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be kinder to my family, but. I'd, I'd get a job, but. I, I, I would take care of my health more, but. I mean, you realize we got a, we got a back end problem. Amen. Too much butt here. Hallelujah. So Shamgar, Shamgar was a farmer. He ain't a fighter. He's a farmer. That's what he does. He's not a warrior, 
But he fought anyway. He used what he had, and that was an ox goad. Listen to me. What you work with is what you win with. What you work with is what you win with. Find out what it is you work with. You know, if it's prayer, you work with prayer. Amen. If it's preaching, you work with prayer. If it's singing, you work with singing. Whatever it is that you got, amen, you, you work with your influence in life, you got gifts and talents that God put in your life. You work with them gifts and talents. But what you work with is what you're going to win with. For Moses, it was a rod. For Samson, it was a jawbone. For David, it was a sling. It was a stone. And it was a song. Sometimes a song to God can turn things around. For Shamgar, it was simply an ox goat, a farmer's tool for driving the oxen. Amen. You know, and then he began, that roar come back alive in him. He got out. And the Bible don't tell us how. It just said that 600 Philistines fell under uh, that ox goat and Shamgar. Now, that's one at a time. Again, you got to imagine the presence of God, the Spirit of God came on these judges. Samson couldn't do what he could do without the presence of God. Gideon couldn't do what he could do without the presence of God. Amen. The presence of God came all over Shamgar. And I mean, you know, it's, just that, it's that supernatural. Yeah, what? He hit a guy, knocked him down. He's a farmer, not a warrior. Hits a guy, takes him out. Then another guy comes running out. He hits that guy. And he realizes eight foot was a good extension. They can't get to me. He's just poking one and one for 20 and 40 and 60, 100, 200, five, 600 dead Philistines laying in the road. Surely the word got back. No wonder he became a judge. Amen. The people back off away from a man like that. You don't want to mess with Shamgar. Amen. Uh, the, you don't want to mess with him. That's a bad dude. What happened to him? He got fired up. You know why he got fired up? Listen to this. A man without a future always reverts back to his past. And if I don't do something about my future, and if I don't have a future, I'll go back to this old farmer that I've been. I'll keep going through the byways again. I'll keep going through the woods again. i got to make a change here. So he has to see himself in the future. And if you ain't got a future, boy, I say this. To everyone I meet, I mean, I, I got messages this week. Pastor and my husband tried to take his life. Got to give him a future. I visited with a man today in the hospital, in, in, in almost a hospice. I got to give him a future. I got to give him a hope he'll see us again this week. You got to give yourself a hope. You got to get, and I, I don't know why, H, that some people can go through life and they're so positive and you know they're having problems. You know they're struggling. You know they're crying. You know they fight their own depressions and devils. But they jump up out of it and they keep on going because a roar comes out of them and others just roll over, give up, and quit. You want to kick them with your bad foot. Get up, man. Don't stay this way. I'm having to fight to keep my roar alive. Why don't you get your roar alive? Amen. Why don't we hear it in church more? Amen. Why can't I hear you excited more about the things of God? Man, this ain't all there is. You're getting old. You're going to get out of here like the rest of us. We're going to get a, a home in glory. Amen. With all my family and friends. Glory to God. You know, they, when you've got attitude like that, when your attitude shifts and you activate that attitude, what's the devil going to do to you? Send you to heaven? Is that the best you got? Are you hearing me? Amen. That, that's how, so you got to get fired up. Shamgar, he took them out one at a time. The Philistines, well, listen, the Philistines failed to reckon with a man who had had enough and who had God who stood behind him and a roar within him. You know who I remind, this reminds me of? Jesus. When I study what Jesus did when he was here, he kept life so simple. And sometimes I think we've made church a little more than what it, than God intended. God intended for this to be a house of prayer. He intended this to be a place to be discipled. God intended for the church to be a family, and there'd be connections made, and there'd be kindness in the house. That's what God expected. But we got all this, what my friends are calling candy. You know, it, we, we, we do. We got built-in coffee shops and places. We've got, and I'm not against that, by the way. I think it's a great thing to get some here in the morning. But I'm talking about, y'all ain't seen the coffee shops I'm talking about. Full-blown Starbucks inside of churches. ATM machines everywhere, uh, the music, concerts going on. It just, it, it, and a little 15 minute message, and you haven't learned anything. You hadn't got anything. You just went there and <sighs> fulfilled a, what's that? Yeah, it's feel good. It's about feel good. But sometimes church don't feel good. Sometimes church hurts. It does, man. I mean, when I come here and I see people that I've loved for so long and they're not serving God or something's gone on, it hurts. You know, it hurts. But it puts me on my knees. It keeps me a place to pray. Amen. 
And then I'm, I'm going to come out of here with a roar. Hallelujah. Because that's great. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus first, he came to save sinners. I got a call before I got here. Pastor, will you go visit my ex-husband? He's uh, drugs, this, that, and the other. And I think, ah, this, this man walked with God. We got to turn this thing around. Even that's the only thing that runs through my mind. But when Jesus showed up, he, he said, uh, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul said, you know what? Honestly, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. So he came here to save sinners. He meant rescue them, pull them out, catch those, snatch them away, the closest ones to the flames. Amen. That's what Jesus came to do. Second thing he came to do, destroy the devil. Just destroy the devil. Amen. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. Amen. To find out what that devil was working and destroy his works. That's why he showed up. Pretty simple. You know, what? You, when you study Jesus, he never lost his roar. Never lost it. And by the way, roars don't always have to be real. You know, it's just because you're the loudest person in the bunch don't mean you got a roar. Are you hearing me? It don't have to always be loud. Sometimes it's just confidence. Lions. You know, I, I love to hear lions roar. I do. I, I, if I was to go to a safari, I'd be so disappointed if the lion just walked by me, stared at me, kept walking. I, I want to hear it roar, you know. I just want I just want to hear that roar go off. Yeah, I just want to feel, feel the tremble, you know. But, but just the fact that lion is up walking around already enough. Amen. That, that, that boy is intimidating when I see lions. Lions never look over at, at, at elephants and go, man, I'm scared of that big guy. They don't do it. Amen. Territorial, they run the thing. There's a reason why Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. He's not the turkey of the tribe. He's the lion of the tribe. And he closed here, guys. Your, your roar will clear your road. Your prayer life will clear your road. Your, the fact that you're standing up for God, amen, in the time of evil will clear your road. Amen. Sometimes you've got to get your roar back. And your roar is your attitude. It's your confidence, amen, that you've got. And you've got to get fed up with stuff. You know, you find in your roar will free the terrorism that affects your life, and you'll get your road back. And when I think about my road, and I just real quickly wrote it down, my road is my family, my wife who has no cancer now, my five kids who I constantly pray for, reach out to, connect with, amen, what concerns them, that concerns me, my grands, what concerns them, concerns me, the ministry God gave us, TLCC here, amen, and out there, the people of this house, the unsaved, these are part of my road. Sometimes I'll make somebody my road. I'll decide, you know what? You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. Hey, man, I'm coming for you. I told a, I told a family in the church a while back, that daddy, he's just a heathen to the court. I said, I want you to tell your daddy something for him. Tell him pastor praying for him. Every time I get around him, I'll, 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 I'll snap a picture with me and him. What are you doing? I said, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Amen. I want God put a Holy Ghost hook in your jaw. Yank you back, amen, because you know better than be acting a fool like you're doing they just smile at them then. Just, just keep my confidence alive. But go after somebody. Amen. That, that's a part of your roar. Your community. To love this community. To love this nation. To thank God for where you're at. Your health. Sometimes your health has to change. And the only way it changes is you get fed up. And you get fired up. I, I went and worked out today. I walk in with this boot on my foot. And I, I go hop on that, that, on that bicycle. And I'm going to get my three miles in. And folks just look at me. I mean, what's your problem? I got one good one. My health, you got to hear the roar. Sometimes I love just to roar when I'm worshiping to remind God that I am a lion. I am not anymore a sheep. Amen. You don't have to coddle me, God. Amen. I'm, I'm ready for whatever you've got. And when it comes to this church, this church is your road. You defend this church. You love this church. Amen. The people in this house. And, you know, and again, Sunday, we'll be, we'll be pretty full Sunday. I believe in God for that. I thought this Sunday we did real well. Amen, people coming in. But again, it's not who's just in here. It's who we missing. Going after them and keep reaching for them. Keep loving them. And some folk, my God, they make it hard to love, don't they? Amen. You, use your Bible not as a weapon, but as a way to learn. Keep discipling yourself and growing in yourself. Father, I love you. I thank you for the people of God in this house. I ask your blessing on those that are watching online tonight. I thank you for your goodness. 
It's, you're so good to us. Oh, God, let the roar come back in this house. Lord, let people sense that prayer. Lord, in my mind, I'm thinking right now of men and women who have been saved, born again, and the Spirit of God just come all over them and the excitement about being in church. Lord, that's why we do what we do. I thank you, Lord, for putting the roar here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Amen. There's a few other things coming up. And I'm sure Sister Lori will throw them up on the overhead for y'all to see them again. But I love y'all. Thank you for coming out tonight. Invite somebody.